Great it is to be here with so many close friends and colleagues. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope uh, you get seconds if there's more food. And uh, frankly, I'm really excited to be here and spend some good time with you. This room holds a lot of great memories. I hope uh, we create one today together. In embracing uncertainty, what I want to share with you today are three lessons that for me have been really impactful in my personal life, in my professional life. These are lessons I think that we all go through. I think it's a lifelong journey. But I've also seen, after having built hundreds of products for hundreds of software companies, that there are some patterns to this. And I hope you, I hope you gain some insights in those patterns today. We gain insights into those patterns as a company. We're a software consulting firm and a strategy firm at Veracity. A lot of the problems that we help solve can be described in these, in these circles. And Jordan, if you wouldn't mind, we could probably kill some of the lights up top here so that uh, these aren't faded out as much. Whether the strategy you have for your software product is unclear, or you've made a promise that's at risk of hitting that particular deadline. If the user experience that you're trying to create in your product is, is not up to par, where you think that there's a gap that could be closed, or you're trying to expand to a new technical platform, maybe getting a brand new product out the door, or having the product that you currently have today more stable, more scalable, more effective, or if the team themselves, the very engine of the company that builds these products itself needs improving and tuning. These are problems that we all face as executives. Through Veracity, you can, help, you can count on us to help you lead those projects and those products, help lift your team, and help you get the right things done. We really focus from top down on strategy, on architecture, on user experience, and on agility of the organization as a whole. 80% of what we do is design, code, and test of great products. But along the way, what makes us different is this model called blend sourcing, where we help lift your team. Imagine our experts paired up with your experts, getting the right things done and becoming better at what they do along the way. That's our philosophy. For 18 years, it's been our, it's been our uh, secret sauce, you might say. So as a, as, a, as a company, we're really aligned around how do we help you deliver better software every time. And so in the topic of embracing uncertainty, I think that the, you'll find, I hope, these three lessons insightful and applicable in your own organizations. This is part of a larger seminar that we give. We have a two-day innovation workshop, and this, plays a, this, this topic plays a major role over several hours. But in this next 30 minutes, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version, and uh, happy to share the slides as we continue. Okay, uncertainty. Many of us look at the waters of uncertainty with the eyes of an engineer. And we look at that and say, I can handle that, I can build a bridge as far as it needs to go, and I can tackle the unknown. Because in school, I've learned how to create great Gantt charts and beautiful plans and sophisticated architectures. And then we over plan and we over budget and we over worry, and then we sometimes wonder why our projects are overdue and overbuilt and over engineered. These tools that we've developed over the years can be really useful for engineering-centric projects mm -hmm. where we really do need effective analysis and planning and expertise. If we're building a jet engine, boy, this is the approach. But there's a set of problems that feel more like this, that feel gut-wrenching and difficult, and the answers aren't necessarily clear. This is the space of uncertainty. How does it feel when we have a product that we don't know the end date in sight. How many features would it take for the customers to be delighted in that particular product? How does it feel when we've inherited a high risk project or we're trying to raise a rebellious teenager? There aren't clear answers. And if we apply these philosophies, I propose we're setting ourselves up for more grief and failure than if we apply some of, some of more of the effective methods that have been around for centuries but haven't yet reached software development effectively. And so instead of worrying and, and fretting and thinking, well, the only way I can survive in uncertainty is by just grinning and bearing it like some shot at the doctor, I propose we can embrace it and jump in and really enjoy it. How? I believe that there are three main lessons. One, we need to ourselves and help our organizations overcome the impulse of fear and the, and the feelings of fear by practicing awareness in the work that we do by really having healthy responses to these difficult, gut-wrenching emotions. Second, we need to overcome our impulse to control the outcome by first accepting what's unknown, and then whether we dip our toe in the water or jump in headlong, we can embrace the uncertainty by experimenting, 
first with trepidation, first and next with a sense of maybe this will work, and ultimately with confidence. So today we're going to talk about these three lessons. So first, let's go back to this murky water and say, how does uncertainty feel? You just, you know, feel free to blurt it out. How does it feel when we inherit a high-risk project? Those gut-wrenching things that we don't feel like are within the realm of control. Any thoughts? Paranoid. Paranoid, right? Paranoid of what? Of uh, the outcome. Yeah. What's going to get me, right? I'm, I'm going to go around this corner and, oh man, I'm in trouble. Other thoughts? Overwhelming. So it can actually help us feel like, ah, we can spin in circles. We don't know what we're going to do next. Uh, our faculties that we're used to exercising go on tilt and overload. Okay, great. How else does it feel? Gwendolyn, you've never been in this situation. Um, yeah, definitely fear. Fear. Yeah. Fear is the right word. It's hard to get started. It's hard to find where the entry point is. Yeah. So these, this experience is something that we've all had, whether professionally or personally. Fear, anxiety, um, depression, uh, frustration, anger. Neil? That's right. And ultimately in that risk, it's a question of, am I as a professional going to simply accept that shift of risk and say, well, okay, I got it, it's all on me. Or perhaps are our skills better leveraged to help manage the risk? Today we'll talk about risk management. Corvin. That's right. And everyone has an opinion about what happens, right? Yeah. And, and your executives might be used to the fact of saying, look, life, life uh, lines up nicely and we build bridges and that's what we do. What do you mean you don't know the answer? And there's a lot of pressure to, to give an answer even if we're not entirely sure about it. So the dynamic and the business conversation is in many cases broken in these realms of uncertainty. Now, if, again, if we're building jet engines, maybe it's a little bit different unless we're a test pilot. But, but software feels oftentimes more like this. How do we often respond? What are common responses to these, in, in you know, this overwhelmed, frustrated state of risk shift? Procrastination. Okay, we put it off, it's like, oh man, I, that could really go bad. Those of us who have done taxes before know how, know how hard <laughs> the 1040 is, and we put off doing the 1040 because we know how bad it can get and how few deductions we're gonna receive, right? How else, what are other common responses, Dennis? Some people just start working, do anything, yeah. just to look busy. There's a shotgun approach, a mad f uh, fury where sometimes we mistake activity for progress. I think that's like a knee-jerk. Yeah. And it's sometimes a reaction more than a response. Matt? Uh, shoot and aim. Okay. So it can, it can be frustrating. And we use you know, ready, fire, aim type um, derogatory statements to say, you know, people should be able to predict the future better. But the truth is, we can't. And how we respond really matters. All these stimuli that come into our systems, uh, whether those systems are internal and personal or whether they're our companies, um, really, really uh, have a hard time. Uh, sorry, we have a hard time being mindful in our response. Many of you know Viktor Frankl. He's a World War II survivor whose family was brutally uh, murdered in, in concentration camps. And he went through extremely difficult circumstances that I can't pretend to begin to understand. And yet he had this profound thing to say about how we respond to difficulty. That between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. In short, between feeling the stimulus of uncertainty and any response we might make, he says that there's a space. It's like a pause button that we can push and say, how do I choose to respond? And, and my first lesson is, I advise us to exercise this muscle, our ability to pause and decide how we're going to respond. Let's give it a try. So many of you, when you first saw this, uh, probably thought like I did and anticipated, even instantly and automatically, that she was about to say something that probably wasn't terribly nice, <laughs> right? And that part of you was automatic, almost instantaneous, intuitive, you can't actually choose not to have that kind of a think and, and thought about, about how uh, you can't choose to not respond in that type of way. 
So some of it is just, hey, this is who I am. This is how I respond. And sometimes we get caught up in thinking, well, that's just natural. That's, that's all I have. But what about this? Instantly, you probably recognize this as a mathematics problem. But you'd have to really think carefully about whether you know, the answer is 400, 567, what have you. And you'd know instantly that it wasn't 123 or 5,000. But you'd, ha you'd get to choose what to do with these stimuli. This uses a different center of our brain. In fact, it's almost like we have two brains. And over time, thousands of years, researchers and leaders alike have come up with different names for this idea of these dual processes that exist within our minds. Jonathan Haidt, in his book, The, Hypo the Happiness Hypothesis, described these systems as elephant and rider. Kahneman, Nobel winning laureate, Nobel laureate, described them as system one and system two. A lot of fun National Geographic brain games stuff about system one and two. But borrowing from the Buddha, Jonathan Haidt described this interaction between these two parts of our brain as, again, elephant and rider, where there's this emotional center and a rational center. The self that, ex that only sees now. I only experience what I'm, what's going on right now at this instant. Whereas our rational self has an ability to remember. It's more longitudinal. Am I happy? Well, it depends on which self I'm, I'm responding from. Am I happy in this instant? Am I happy generally? Do I remember being happy this summer? So these, these are different centers in our brain. And there aren't literally two sides of our brain. This isn't hemispheric. But these are models and processes that help us understand how we can better respond. We've got um, fast type thinking here with the elephant, slow thinking with the rider. You experience in looking at the picture of that woman that it, you, didn't you couldn't necessarily control, right, Zach, with how I'm going to respond. And yet, at this time, I could choose whether to do the multiplication problem. The elephant has a weakness in that what it sees is all there is. It's very myopic, and it only knows what it can experience. Love me some Doctor Who. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, and one of the weaknesses of the writer is that it's, it's frankly often lazy. Sometimes the writer just listens to input coming from the elephant. And we rationalize and say, well, I'm really angry right now and I'm really fearful about this. And so that's simply, that's simply the world and the reality. And we, and we just based on input from the elephant then chart our course without pausing and really taking a look around and saying, why am I feeling this way and what could be contributing to it? Finally, uh, the elephant's constantly delivering thousands of updates a minute, uh, whereas the rider is ultimately the uh, execution center of our brain. Let me tell a quick story about uh, how this happens. Um, in 2008, I was faced with a legal battle, uh, having just a successful startup that our partner didn't want to release open source, but instead wanted to privatize and uh, subsume within their organization. I was frustrated, I was a minority partner, I didn't feel like I really had the choice and the chance, and I had legal means at my disposal to lash out, cost people their jobs, and get, my com get what was coming to me and, and get what I was due. And, and, I, and I paused, thankfully, thanks to the counsel of our attorney. And he said, you know, Galen, you could choose to do what's emotional, or you could choose to do what's rational. And it's really your choice. You get, you get the chance to pause, look ahead, and decide what it is you want to do. Yeah, you could go either way, but what do you want to do? And I spent days thinking about it. And finally, in October, I, I decided to do something that did not benefit me in the short term. I lost you know, five figures in the short term on that particular venture. But I preserved the relationships that I measured as being more valuable than the, than the quick wins. I preserved the relationships with a set of investors and maintained lifelong friendships that have been really meaningful to me. And these are people that I still work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it also happens, if, if you measure some of the monetary against those five figures, we've won seven figures in business with some of those same people over those intervening years. It, um, the money's less important of a measure than it is the relationships that we've maintained these many years. But I had to really pause. I had to think, OK, how do I choose to respond? And I was able to uh, have growth and freedom according to Frankel. Mindfulness is the science of and, and practice of really being aware of how we, of what we're experiencing today and acknowledging that it's real, accepting it, and then making a mindful choice about where we want to go. 
uh, researchers published in the Harvard Business Review described it as emotional agility, that ability to recognize what I'm feeling and give it a name, and then accept the fact that we feel that way and act according to the values that we have. So in the space of uncertainty, we get to press that pause button and say, why do I feel the way I do? How am I choosing to respond? And uh, that has given me a tremendous amount of strength personally it's also given me enough time where the elephant and rider can be in alignment to where I can really see more of what's going on and see some of the other patterns that we'll talk about today. But a lot of organizations and a lot of people get stuck in this quagmire of saying, well, the only way I can deal with the unknown is by predicting the future and, and just grinning and bearing it and taking all the risks that I'm being given. And my response is no, that's, that's actually not a productive response. And I don't believe it's what our executives would have us do either or what we'd have our teams do if we're in an executive position. So today, I'd invite you to think about what is something on your plate that makes you uncertain? And measure the things we learned today and talk about against that uncertain thing. Could be a new product, could be a business partner that you're having struggles with, could be uh, something in your personal life, a child, a spouse. It could be a community problem that you're trying to solve and thinking, well, there's really just no, there's no use in trying. And that defeatist attitude really is not a place of responsibility. You might feel shame and guilt and so on, but instead, you get to choose a response and to choose one hopefully that's healthy and practice awareness. Number two, I believe that by accepting what we don't know, uh, it gets us out of the second bad reaction. Specifically, we have this impulse, at, even if we're mindful about it and say, okay, I, I'm, I can see the situation clearly, our next impulse is to control everything. We, we try to build this bridge again over these uncertain waters. We do more business plans, more uh, marketing requirements documents and, and product requirements specifications, more sophisticated charts and more sophisticated engineering the more we continue to grow. And these, these tend to be our default go-to problem-solving tools. In fact, we see the world as really just having one, one axis. There's the world of the obvious where cause and effect is just like a bicycle. And this is a place where it's just about following rules because, come on, that's what we all do. Just do what I say and, and get it done because that's, that's, that's in my toolkit. And if I don't know the answer, I can go to a better expert. And I can, it's just a more complicated problem than we've seen before and I can hire a better expert who's gonna, to them, feel like cause and effect is more obvious. And uh, I just need to analyze the problem and I can sit in a room at length and figure it out and, and cause it to be done. This is the space of certainty. And when we're faced with the unknown, as was mentioned before, we expect this certainty. We expect the world to behave this way, but how much do we really control? How much do we really control the traffic patterns between here and our offices about whether there's gonna be an accident on the, on the highway and the freeway? What is it that causes us to uh, still interact in this world? You know, my phone may run out of batteries and I may miss 10 text messages that are critical. Um, my, my, my sweet daughter may get in a car wreck on the way home. Uh, the, there are so many things that we, in fact, don't control. We don't even control whether the fire alarm is going to go off in five minutes. No, no, uh, no, no ideas, Scott. But, but, the, but as, as in, our, in our software minds, we tend to expect this rationality to, to apply to the world. And the truth is, it's analog. Man, the world is analog. And all of our engineering training has trained us to believe that the world has simply bits and bytes and ones and zeros and black and white. But in reality, that's the exception, not the rule. You look at two nights ago, where we have um, Kerry Welsh Jennings and April Ross. They've won three gold medals, they're on track for their fourth. But their coach for the last two Olympics said something really interesting on TV two nights ago. He said, I can't control if we're gonna win. I can control whether we do the right things, whether we practice, whether we hit the ball effectively and so on. And so in uncertainty, the sphere of control is smaller, but it's still there. There are things we can do and that helps combat the frustration and the overwhelmed feeling, realizing that there are things, in fact, that we can do. But if we're stuck on this idea of certainty, like uh, German philosopher Eric Fromm said, we're really going to block our search for meaning. Uncertainty is the condition that, in fact, un encourages us to unveil and unfold the powers that we have. So the world doesn't just look like this. In fact, the continuum continues. There's the world of the complex. We're gonna call these green problems. And in the complex, cause and effect is only available after the fact. I can't predict the future here. It's a complex ecosystem, like introducing a new species into a, in a biome. 
where I don't know what's going to happen to my favorite frog. This is a space of entrepreneurship. There are cases where there's no cause and effect in chaos, and that's the space of firefighting. This is a science of a Welsh uh, scientist called, uh, called Kinefin. And so you could look at this scale on the, on the left and say there are areas of low uncertainty and high uncertainty, and there's really a line here. And in that line, uh, we find that the blue problems respond well to planning down below, whereas the green problems take a different approach. In fact, as we look at that specific line, the creator of Kinefin said, don't approach highly uncertain green problems with the same methods you've used for, for certain blue problems. Don't do it. Don't cross that line, because frankly, it doesn't work. There's a scientific reason why, and it has to do with cause and effect. You cannot predict the outcome. Therefore, if you try, you're, um, you're giving yourself a false sense of confidence. And it isn't that, you know, as some agilists say, well, you can never know the future. That's just agile development. No, that's, that, that doesn't work. What we have is, in fact, the scientific method. This has been around for, for millennia. It's designed to help us actually explore the future, not just execute toward it, to find out what emerges, not just succumb to our abilities to analyze, to enable good processes, not to force and govern them, to prepare so we, can't, so we won't fear over just giving root to the idea that, or food to the idea that we just plan ourselves to death. We experiment more than we try to control in this space. I like this quote that says, faith in order to be faith, and if the concept of faith makes you uncomfortable, think experiment. An experiment in order to be an experiment must center around something that is not known. It has to go beyond that for which there is confirming evidence. Faith to be faith must go into the unknown. It must walk to the edge of the light and then a few steps to the darkness. In this space, we still can take a few steps, but we don't necessarily know or control exactly where we're going in all of these ways, and we need to accept it. It's just scientifically the way it is. However, there's a lot that we can do. The story doesn't end here, thankfully. And what I'd like to do in the final 10 minutes is just take you through a quick survey of some of the systems that have been created today to actually solve these types of problems. You'll recognize many. Hopefully, a few will be new. And then I'd like to end with the story. At, at Veracity, we've looked at these patterns. And so I want to I wanna just emphasize, in these problems of green and blue, we've come up with a methodology we call product launch. And this helps us understand where are we in the continuum of low to high uncertainty with the problems that we're trying to solve in a particular product line. And then we look at it longitudinally in time and say, how much have we discovered? And are we on the same page? Are we really aligned about what needs to be created for this product? And then, hey, let's go get it done. Don't mistake this for waterfall because this is a highly iterative process. However, these phases exist in any minimally viable product that I'm trying to get out the door. Down, and so there are sets of both blue and green problems in this, in this space. Many of you will recognize the standard agile approach to sitting in a room and with sticky notes describing what a plane would look like and how to fly it. And then you plan that endeavor and then you, over a series of iterations, will push to the market what matters most because frankly it's easier to predict. This, these are blue problems. This is the space of heavy analysis and deep expertise and jet engines. It works. But when you're in the space of higher uncertainty, you actually have to fly the plane. You can't just talk about it. You have to do something. In fact, you have to get out of the building. You can't just plan away risk. You, you have to address the big things that are going to go wrong. You've got to have your own Mercury and Gemini programs. You've got to understand what it is that caused the fire in Apollo 1 and the tragic deaths of the three astronauts. You've got to grow in your ability to launch in order to learn. You're actually getting that product out the door so that you can figure out what it is the market wants. And ideally, if you're doing it well, you're creating a sense of pull, not push, mm -hmm. where the market, that interaction with the market, will cause them to pull out of your hand, sometimes even before it's ready, that product you hold so dear. It will change your opinion. You will evolve your thinking of that as you go. And so as a, as a, as a methodology, this becomes then an ordered approach to an unordered problem. We can't control the outcome necessarily of all these green issues, but we can control the process with which we approach it. And so what gives us faith and confidence and structure is our approach to the uncertain problem. And we get to let go of the certain outcome for a season. Because in reality, this is kind of what it feels like to create a new company or to create a new product. 
And over here on the right, we can forecast maybe 80% of the features, and this is where Agile tends to work really well. But in the middle, uh, this 50% mark, Donald Reinertsen in his book, Product Development Flow, talks about this 50% mark where he says, you really need to take a different approach. You really need to be led by design. And where Agile works well in these plan-driven, mostly blue domains, and accounts for spikes and other things you need in green. Agile as a software development methodology is really at its limits here in that 50% mark. And you need to introduce this catalyst of design. You really have to understand, not just design in the room, but design with the market, design with your customers. Because you can't hire a customer to go tell you exactly what you need either. And so this design-driven approach really matters. And you could stop here and say, great, design is the answer to all these problems. But no, there's more. When uncertainty really rears its head, and you're earlier on in this sticky wicket, this is where Agile itself breaks down. And a set of methods commonly attributed to lean really break open uh, the problem much better than these structured two-week iterations approaches. When your sprints, your two-week sprints, are, are aborting constantly, when you make a decision and all of a sudden you're in, you know, more than half of your backlog changes, you know you're in this space. And so these innovative driven methods are much more effective. So with Veracity, we tend to look at these three project types. We tend to look at projects that are mostly blue, those that are hybrid between them and design driven, and those that are highly green. And we apply different methodologies based on these three classes of, of, um, of products that we build. And so we've developed an expertise over the years of really sensing where are we and what methodologies do we apply. Now I want to dive in and tell you some of the secrets that are behind this even further. And don't think that a project's always green or blue, by the way. You know, it's really a set of different problems. And what's interesting is the density of problems. So you end up with projects that have density of problems, whether, you know, whichever color they are. And then the problems themselves are in one of these Kinefin domains. And you do apply different approaches based on those problems. Imagine um, that the stories themselves, what if the stories were marked green or blue? You know, would that change the way that we're actually pushing these features to market? So here's how you recognize when you're in that space of uncertainty. It, it matters how you feel, and pay attention to that. It's not 100% predictive, but often it's a great indicator of saying, wait a minute, what am I dealing with? And you can hit that pause button. And then when you can sense that cause and effect would only be obvious in hindsight, or when, they, when, you, when you sit down to plan, by whatever method you use to plan, you can sense, I think I'm gonna be able to develop only less than half of, of this feature set. You know, what, what I think needs to be created, I'm not exactly sure. And rather than just wallowing in it and staying in, the, staying in the building and trying to plan our way through it, get out of the building. All right, we've talked about those. So let's, let's close up with these experiments and stories. So in reality, we don't control uncertainty. Not in our lives, not with our teenagers, not with our spouses. It, it's really not about control. All these impulses that we have to cause the world, to force the world to be the way that we want it, dang it, because we're good at it, we have to let that go to some measure. We still ultimately control ourselves and our own action and, and our own responses to the world. And as Frankel said, that is an amazingly powerful influence. But there's a limit to what we control. We have to turn guesses into knowledge through the scientific method. Now, many of you have seen Lean Startup and its frame, build, measure, learn approach. Just by show of hands, how many are familiar with Lean Startup? Okay, fantastic. I love, I love, I hope hands continue to go up uh, as we do this. But Lean Startup essentially says, if I have an idea, it's most effective to actually go and build it. Notice it doesn't say sit in a room and plan. I need to then build something of value and measure how well it worked. And with that data, learn new ideas to then repeat the process. And the quicker I go through this process, the more effective an engine I'm creating for building the right thing. Because in reality, over two thirds of software built is rarely or never used. That is an amazing multi-billion dollar waste. However, Lean Startup, as great as it is, I believe is missing a step, and several other researchers feel the same way. That in reality, we need to frame the problem that we're trying to solve, not just build an idea. So this step, this framing of the step is really critically important. Stanford researchers in the design school name it design thinking, where through empathy and through, through research, I need to make sure that I sharpen the problem that I'm trying to solve, rather than just think that the solution I have is one I want to push to market. You'll see that theme recur as we continue on. Lean Startup emphasizes creating an hypothesis that we can measure then against the results that we expect. And don't get lazy and say, well, you know, because I failed, I'm just going to retroactively call that an experiment. Because, you know, that's what we do. <laughs> Failure is expected, right? We've got to get used to that as well. 
but we've got to be disciplined in the way that we approach it so that we can validate the learning because if we don't have a hypothesis, we're not going to actually know what we're testing. If we don't know what we're testing, we're not going to learn and the scientific method breaks down. We all did this in grade school with our science projects. We just need to resurrect it. And instead of looking at a painting and saying, I know exactly how that's going to turn out and building one module in high fidelity at a time, we need to imagine some distant goal and iterate toward it. Is the hand up? Is it down? Is it orange? Is it dark? Okay, and then we finally get there. This is the space of iterating toward an uncertain idea, where the principle ultimately is coming from a vague idea to a finished product by learning, pivoting, and making course corrections as needed, and improving quality as we go. Those who expect us to solve the risks will be more entranced by our ability to take them through this process than they will by any promise we can make them that can predict the future. They cannot replace you with somebody who can predict the future. They can only replace you with someone who will lie to them. So there are a couple of methods. One is known as Lean UX, where two times a week I'm creating a hypothesis for a small feature and I'm going out and I am talking with customers about it. I'm taking a, a really crude sketch. This is from an iOS application we built for a local Salt Lake company. And uh, taking that feature to market in some controlled test and saying, please use it. And I'm not telling them how to use it. With that paper prototype, I'm, I'm giving them, I say, hey, please, um, please change the language to Spanish. Please uh, add a credit card. Uh, prescribe a medication, prescribe Tylenol to the patient. And, and they go through those and you measure objectively how well do they do in those systems. And I can build software really quickly with a Sharpie and, pens and paper and test a lot of assumptions. Because in reality, I, I, I again need to step out of that engineering mindset. Building code, though it's something that I can do, is not necessarily the tool that I need to apply in uncertainty. What I really need to test is the risks. What is it that makes it uncertain? Where am I getting that fear, that overwhelming nature from? And let's go attack that first. Like a tracer bullet, I'll fire just enough code and systems into that, into that dark forest so I know how to solve the risk. I can build a highly scalable SaaS system. I can put it out on AWS and make sure that it works effectively. Um, those are known engineering blue problems for the most part. I want to solve the green ones first because those are the killers. Those are the product and company killers. Before I try to build everything as a software architect, I want to make sure that the stuff I build actually fits together in a meaningful way and in this comical way actually walks. It's mobile, it's ambulatory, it can do something meaningful. It's not a full creature, everybody knows that. But if I can prove that a sucker can walk, I know I can build flesh and muscle and sinew on top of it and create a great you know, brown hair and, and, and uh, make, it all, make it all work great. But Because that's not the hard problem. The hard problem is actually proving that we're building the right thing and answering the question of should it even be built. Lean Canvas, by show of hands, how many are familiar with this system? Okay, a great approach. We don't have time today to go into all of it, but Lean Canvas is a, is a nine frame methodology built on what's called the business model canvas that helps create an entire business plan on one 11 by 17 sheet of paper. Wouldn't that be great? How much, you know, if we never had to read another 150 page business plan? I'd love that. These are the critical nine things that you need to figure out if you're building a new tech product. Business Model Canvas addresses them slightly differently. It's a fantastic book, and the supplement book, Value, value Proposition, uh, it, it are all fantastic, worthwhile things. But notice the trend. What is the problem? And for whom am I really solving it? And then what's the solution, and how am I going to measure whether I'm successful? What value am I actually creating in the market in the high-level concept? Am I going to get to the customer directly, or am I going to go through particular channels? What is it that makes it completely unfair that I'm the one helping to build this product with my team? I may have the best idea for the next restaurant application, but if I don't have an unfair advantage, I better stop that. I better, you know, it's better for me to not continue in that venture than it is for me to succumb to the idea that just because I have a great idea, everybody's going to buy it. I, there's, I've got to have a hook. And then, of course, I look at the P&L, the profit and loss, down below with revenue and cost. It's a business plan. And, and um, you can see that with iTunes, for example, there was this problem of the mountain of CDs. And everybody today was just, every end of the day was using these Walkmans. The unfair advantage was the licensing contracts that Apple had built with iTunes. They were able to exploit that unfair advantage and build a solution that was a Walkman for the digital age for these early adopter Mac conscious customers. And I'd buy it, and I'd have some cost to go along with it, 
But in reality, that solution ended up really making a difference. Why? Because they focused on the problem first, and that really matters. And in Lean Canvas, you iterate just like you would in software, and you look at sets of canvases that say, ah, now that's the one that I want to go forward with. With the Innovator's Method by Jeff Dyer, he gave a great talk on this recently. Um, and uh, he and his, his colleague Nathan uh, from BYU created a great book called The Innovator's Method that again focuses on gaining insights by interacting with the market, sharpening the problem first before I try to push my magic solution to the market. This is uncertainty. These are approaches that are highly effective for us to approach the market. Too often we, we ask our peers to say, well, tell me the answer. It's the wrong question. Help us find the answer. Help us experiment, help us learn, help us gain insights and really sharpen the problem so that later we can then define the exact right solution and then, and then create a business model around it and then scale it. Too often we start here, which is in reality backwards. And so in these, there's, so, there's such a large body of work that's available to us today as we continue to attack these green problems. We don't need to be afraid. We can run a quick demo of our video like the folks from Dropbox did. It was, a, it was a video demo with just enough scaffolding to make it look like it was a real product. He posted it on a, on a news group uh, over the weekend, had 30,000 subscribers and said, oh, with that simple experiment, I know I've got something great here. And then he said, he emailed each of them and said, fantastic, I will, uh, I'll, build, I'll let you know when it's ready. And then he did the rest of the blue work in actually making it work. But he solved the green problem first is will they buy it? Zappos, their first sh his, his hypothesis was, will people buy shoes on the internet? That was his green problem. He didn't build an e-commerce site. He got that off the shelf until he built his own later. He had a contract uh, with a local shoe manufacturer and said, look, I'll buy these from you wholesale if I can put them online. And if the customers buy it, I'll, I'll come and buy them from you. And, and then uh, I mean, he, he made no profit for those early days. But making profit wasn't the point. Solving the problem was really addressing the highest risk and testing his hypothesis was the problem. With Google, I mean, how many of us, looks like I didn't reorder these. Um, Google had a single key feature. Shine grew through crowdfunding. These are low risk ways to actually grow effective businesses. Shine's original marketing pitch before they even built the product itself was beautiful. You could, you could imagine a future and suspend disbelief long enough to think that that was actually uh, real. Final story with, with Mysis um, a decade ago, we were challenged to build the healthcare product of the future. We had nine weeks, eight people, and we were thrown in a room and said, okay, go invent the future. We really struggled. We were overwhelmed. We were frustrated. For the first two weeks, we, we tried all these areas of, well, we could apply this cool technology and that cool technology, and, as an, and we needed to beat that out of our system a bit. And it wasn't until we started getting out of, away from the keyboard and toward the canvas of sketching things and just imagining those user experiences. And then we were able to grasp on, well, what if when I went into the doctor's room, uh, it, uh, it automatically recognized who I was based on the RFID health card in my, in, my, uh, in my pocket? What if the doctor could actually talk to me in a patient-doctor interaction and the computer could simply listen along and chart as it went because of sophistication and voice recognition? We were imagining these scenarios that would be really, really useful. And then rather than saying, let's go build it, we just tried to tune it down to the key constraints. What were, in the voice recognition scenario, we needed to know whether the technology could support speaker independent, unassisted uh, recognition that could be codified. Well, that's a, that's a problem. That's a green problem. So we went to 10 different speech rec vendors. We narrowed it down to a contest of two, created a proof of concept that showed the technology was still five years out. Great. In $20,000, we prevented the company from making a $5 million investment, but excited the board and said, this is some of the best thought leadership we've seen in our entire organization over the last 10 years. So by small investments, you can really make uh, a big difference by focusing on the problem first, focusing on that green problem. In summary, remember that green and blue problems are fundamentally different. That Overcoming fear and the impulse to control really is a lifelong journey that when you don't have control over the outcome, you can in fact have control and confidence in the process you apply to those uncertain things. You can have an organized approach to disorganized problems. And that's what helps you get through this. That's what helps you take one step at a time, even if it's just brushing your teeth in the morning when you can't think of anything else you need to do. But you can do something 
and then after that, you'll take another step, and another step after that. And after time, after creating these good experiments, one after the next, those feelings of uncertainty and fear will be replaced with knowledge and confidence, with power and love and a sound mind. And so what makes you uncertain? My challenge is to experiment. Get past the fear. Be aware of it, name it, understand its root, and get past it. Accept the things that you can't control and experiment with confidence as you embrace uncertainty. Enjoy the swim. Thank you. Any questions I can help answer in the time we have left? I know time is valuable, you want to network, so I want to give you all the time you want to do that. Are you going to share your deck? I'd be happy to share the deck. Please. It's a really good question. So what you're saying is when I, when I have an idea that has a lot of traction and the customer's demand is outstripping my ability to supply, um, there are two things that we, two strategies that we apply in those scenarios. One is speed, the other is scope. Can we get there faster? And that's a set of equations that we can solve for. But also can we reduce the scope? Can we deliver less? Is something less, is something smaller equally viable? Uh, and that allows us to test the customer's appetite and not fall prey to the bias. Sorry? You've got to make sure you have some sort of quality. Yeah, I think we're assuming that there's some sufficient level of quality that they have. And so, um, the, you know, just like a startup, for example, the startup might need $3 million to really succeed, but you can get a lot done with the, the first 100 k or 50 k So maybe the customers, to reverse the equation, maybe they can get a lot done with less of the product than they're currently demanding. Um, and you can sate some of their appetite, and maybe they, they won't frown, but the, they may take a scooter even though they want uh, an Audi Q7. And, and after that, they'll take, a, they'll take a motorcycle and a Harley. After that, they'll take, a, they'll take a, a Fiat, and then you can later deliver the features that you need. So scope and speed are the two levers that I play the most on, but, but the real risk is what do they really want? And I believe that you can only discover what somebody wants after they can touch and feel it and have it as opposed to them speaking to it, because there's a high risk of confirmation bias, that they might. There's also a, a, a risk to delay do nothing. Yes, which is, which is a very valid business choice, because it's win-win or no deal, right? You know, and so sometimes delay may, even though it might have an impact, you know, we've had to make some hard decisions with some of my friends in this room about saying, we're turning this thing off, because you know, even though it's the greatest idea since sliced bread, we can't get it done fast enough, and, and the market's already starting to consolidate, and, and uh, we're too late. Other questions I can help answer. Richard? Request. Please. Please indeed. Thank you for your time today, your interest, your, uh, your energy and effort. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Have a fantastic networking event and have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.